Appendix B, In Defense of Others, by Kathy Ramey. Pensacola, Florida, may one day be the Selma of the anti-abortion movement. It was on Christmas 1984 that two of the city's abortion mills burst into flames. Happy birthday, Jesus! Leaving one with several thousand dollars in damage, and the other burned nearly to the ground. The trial of four young Christians made national news and is still a subject of conversation years later. Under the murmur of condemnation, there is a sense of grudging respect. These abortion industry abolitionists might be said to have done something that others applaud, but only in secret. On March 10, 1993, Pensacola and her battle with abortion hit the news again, this time internationally as headlines blared that an abortionist was dead shot three times by a man associated with the Right to Life movement. Only the day before, firing bullets into his back, Michael Griffin had stood in church to pray for the soul of baby killer David Gunn. Less than six months later, the furor over force to stop abortion had reached a standstill. Anti-abortion movement leaders had come to a polite and quiet compromise. There were those who argued that the shooting was justifiable and those who publicly condemned it. But any real commitment to a position was postponed. After all, it was the only abortionist casualty in over 20 years of legal abortion. Michael Griffin was seen as an aberration in the right to life movement, even by those who commended him for forcefully protecting unborn children. Then on August 19, 1993, just when it appeared that the anti-abortion movement might resume picketing and protesting as usual, an Oregon woman traveled all the way to Wichita, Kansas, to shoot notorious third-trimester abortionist George Tiller. Rochelle Shelley Shannon fired five shots through the window of a travel-all vehicle to wound Tiller in both arms. After the shooting, she ran from the scene, but was arrested while dutifully returning her rental car. In the wake of these two events, Christians are called to critically examine the use of force, even potentially lethal force, to stop acts of abortion. In light of scriptural injunctives such as, Thou shalt not kill, Exodus 20.13, how is it that any Christian could accord these acts of violence merit as righteous and godly? By saying that Michael Griffin and Shelley Shannon were justified in their actions, are we in reality condoning murder? First, it is imperative to understand that defensive nature of the actions taken by these two people. Both abortionists are known killers in the biblical sense, and both were scheduled to kill again. The actions taken amounted to nothing more than providing a defense for innocent people who were going to be killed by an unjust aggressor. The temptation is to see this as a more complex issue, an act of hatred, vengeance, etc., when in fact it is incredibly simple. There were children who were going to be killed, and someone came to their defense to try to prevent their deaths. The word kill, rashak, in the Sixth Commandment, is one of seven Hebrew words in the Old Testament, OT, used to describe the taking of life in one way or another. It is important to define the specific meaning of this word to determine if this law was actually violated by Griffin and Shannon. Rashak or Ratzak, appears 47 times in the Old Testament. It is never used in the context of a legitimate war, or in the case of self-defense, Exodus 22.2, accidental killing, Deuteronomy 19.5, or in the shedding, or in the execution, rather, of a person who has forfeited his life by shedding man's blood, Genesis 9.6. It is also not used in the text describing how Moses slew the Egyptian taskmaster, all of these scriptures use a different word not found in the Sixth Commandment, and clearly scripture supports certain kinds of killing as viscerally regrettable but righteous nonetheless. The word ratzak does refer to killing for revenge, Numbers 35, 27 and verse 30, and the premeditated killing of an innocent person, 2 Kings 6, 32. Therefore, when the word says, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord, Romans 12, 19. There is a direct connection and precaution against usurping the role of God that relates directly to the sixth commandment. Only two lines later, there is a designation as to whom God has delegated authority to in order to avenge wrongs done, Romans 13, 1. 
The government then, and not the individual, has the right to punish for past offenses. Likewise, there is a similar pattern in Scripture that condemns those like abortionists who, quote, lie in wait for someone's blood, Proverbs 1, 11. And it is specified that the Lord hates hands that shed innocent blood, Proverbs 6, 17. To determine that Griffin and Shannon had violated or sought to violate the Sixth Commandment, we must examine two issues. Number one, did they usurp the government's authority by attempting to punish for killings, Ratzach, done by these abortionists in the past? Or were they engaged in preventing the deaths of children yet to be killed? And number two, do abortionist gun and tiller qualify as innocent blood, in the biblical sense, within the context of these shootings? The answer to the first question ultimately lies with Griffin, Shannon, and God but we are able to make some determinations based on the facts surrounding the events. Michael Griffin shot an abortionist who was going to begin the day's schedule of killing. There were already 12 children in utero inside who were to be aborted. Shelley Shannon immediately made a statement to police in which she said, If ever there was a justifiable homicide, this would have been it. In the March 1994 court testimony in her trial against the charge of attempted murder, Shannon clearly expressed that it was to prevent more killing of innocent babies that motivated her actions. Justifiable homicide under current civil law is applied when a death occurs in the act of defending one's own life or property or the life of another innocent person. It would appear that Shannon's intent, as well as Griffin's, was to prevent more killings of the kind that are clearly forbidden in the Sixth Commandment, not to punish for crimes already committed by the abortionists. As to the second question, abortionist gun has been credited with killing somewhere between 40 and 50,000 unborn children. Abortionist Tiller is nationally known killer who specializes in killing older babies. There are no reporting laws for him to adhere to, but his in-house crematorium and his own public statements in which he claims to do, quote, about 3,000, unquote, every year, are testimony to the fact that he, like David Gunn, does not qualify as innocent blood within the context of these shootings, Genesis 9, 6. Neither Griffin or Sh nor Shannon shot the abortionists for past killings which they had done. They did not usurp governmental authority, and the persons shot because they were engaged in the ongoing process of shedding innocent blood, which is murder, were not violated in the biblical sense. Next, we address the issue of defensive action. Where does scripture say we can use physical force even to the point of taking a life in order to defend ourselves or another? The concept of defensive action is seen in scripture in a number of areas. Abram used force to rescue his relatives, Genesis 14, 14-16, and Moses actually used lethal force against an Egyptian who was in the process of abusing a Hebrew slave, Exodus 2, 11-12. Centuries later, God divinely inspired the writer of the book of Hebrews to mention the period in Moses' life surrounding this event. He is listed in the Hebrews' Hall of Fame, without a word of reproach for this deed, Hebrews 11, 24-27. And Stephen, before being stoned, also testified to the nature of Moses' actions in defense of the slave, Acts 7, 23-25. On a larger scale, Elijah the prophet of God slew 450 prophets of Baal in defense of a nation, 1 Kings 40-40. He was certainly not acting under the authority of God's divinely appointed governors, Ahab and Jezebel, but rather under the singular and divine authority of God. It is also important to pick up the theme of self-defense, which is so easily overlooked in a later chapter of the Exodus account. In the Old Testament, capital punishment is not prescribed for property crimes, yet the thief opens himself up to the risk of death if he is caught breaking into a home in the middle of the night, Exodus 22.1. It is because of the potential risk to innocent life implied by breaking in under cover of darkness that the homeowner is free of blood guilt should he kill the thief in the ensuing effort to protect himself or his family. God simply prefers the life of the innocent over the life of the guilty.
It is God's right to establish such a hierarchy. It is also his right to establish a standard of justice for all men. And while that standard is only fully realized by an examination of all scripture, there are patterns that we may observe which give us an indication of his divine disposition regarding justice for the unborn as well as the born. There are three simple passages of scripture which articulate this point well. They are the famous eye-for-eye, tooth-for-tooth laws. But before looking at them, it is important to realize that there is an underlying principle which is our focus. As Jesus instructed in his Sermon on the Mount, we must avoid an opportunistic interpretation that opens the door to individual retaliation. On the first occasion, when the law prescribes the eye-for-eye eye rule of thumb, it is in the case where a woman with child is struck and caused to go into premature labor. The New International Version translated gives birth prematurely, but more precisely, the Hebrew states brings forth her child, and prematurely is implied. The nearest antecedent is the child, therefore if any injury to the child results, the man who struck the woman and brought about the early delivery of the child is to be wounded so that his injuries are consistent with the injury he has caused to the child. Exodus 21, 22 through 25. In the second instance, the principle of consistent punishment for wrongful injury is more broadly stated. It is said that the, quote, eye-for-eye eye rule of thumb applies in the case where any human being is callously injured by another. As he has injured the other, so he is to be injured, reads the law, Leviticus 24.20. And finally, even the intent and willful act through perjuring one's testimony to harm another is cause for this punishment. The malicious witness is to be punished with the consequences that would have applied to the victim of his lies. Deuteronomy 19.21 In examining these scriptures, we find that they point us toward a single and consistent standard of justice. There is not one standard for black people and another for white people, one for Jews and another for non-Jews, one for unborn and another broader, more protective standard for those who are born. And it is a principle that we see carried over into the New Testament when Jesus tells us that we are to render the care and concern for others that we would wish for ourselves. Luke 6.31 It is argued that if we wish the right to protect ourselves and other innocent born people from the Ted Bundys and Jeffrey Dahmers of this world, we ought not to think that we can deprive the unborn of that same standard of protection. Oh, but there was a premeditated aspect to the shooting of both of the abortionists. In fact, violence, in the form of bombings and arson, all have an aspect of pre-planning. Weren't premeditated acts denounced when Scripture says, But if a man schemes and kills another man deliberately, take him away from my altar and put him to death. Exodus 21, 14. The King James Version gives it a more precise rendering, closer to the original Hebrew, and reads, but if a man comes presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from before mine altar, that he may die. Again, this text does not support an argument against forceful intervention to save an innocent person. The key word rendered presumptuously in the King James Version and deliberately in the NIV is from the Hebrew word zid, it is a word which literally means to act proudly, presumptuously, and rebelliously. It combines three aspects of pride. Number one, presumption that assumes too much of a sense of authority. Number two, rebellion or disobedience by asserting the individual will over that legitimate authority. And number three, a willful decision to act outside the realm of authority given the individual by God. The verse speaks to attitude and authority. And ultimately, we are led directly back to the question of individual authority to mount a forceful defense. Does God allow the individual the right to use force to defend his own innocent life or the life of another innocent person against an unjust aggressor? Certainly, acts which are done outside the realm of authority which God has given to the individual and which are done willfully, rebelliously, out of an attitude of pride, are condemned by this scripture. But if God has indeed given the right of defense to the individual, even though it may result in bloodshed, 
Exodus 22.1, then he has not violated this law. Another issue that causes concern has to do with the perspective one holds with regard to imminency. Surely, in the case of Shelley Shannon, who shot Tiller as he was driving away from his facility, it cannot be argued that there was any child whose life was in immediate danger, so her detractors might say. It may help to answer that concern by posing another question. What is meant among the church crowd when we speak of the imminent return of Jesus Christ? Is it not that while we hope it will be today or tomorrow, we acknowledge that it may in fact occur even after we have fallen asleep in death? So then imminent does not always in every situation imply without delay. In fact, when we speak of the imminent return of Jesus Christ, we are talking about an event which is certain to occur. It is that certainty that compels us towards specific actions and attitudes in anticipation. Likewise, when an abortionist has endured in killing children for a period of time, or has expressed a commitment to that action via Yellow Pages advertising and purchase of special equipment and facilities, might we not say that there is a strong certainty that he will continue to kill children, whether his vehicle is pointed away from the facility at the time he is shot or not? Some Christians will point out that biblically, as far as the right to use force is concerned, our pattern is predominantly Old Testament, therefore Old Covenant, and so we rightfully are challenged to examine the New Testament to understand better whether or not an individual is entitled to use force to protect either himself or another innocent person against an unjust aggressor. There is no definitive scripture which can be cited to overrule the Old Testament principles regarding the use of force for defensive purposes. There is no indication that God's personality progressed or that he experienced a, con a conversion process himself as Jesus went to the cross, from an angry and punishing God to an accommodating fellow. Rather, his propensity for justice is constant and enduring. With regard to New Testament examples of force, we find that on two occasions, Jesus Christ drove money changers, buyers and sellers, from the temple. My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers, he proclaims while overturning tables. Matthew 21, 13, Mark 11, 15 through 17, Luke 19, 45 to 46. His forceful behavior might be dismissed as simply fulfillment of prophecy, except that the event occurs twice. There is an occasion recorded only by John early in Jesus' ministry, where we are given more detail and therefore more insight into the event. Upon finding a bizarre atmosphere in the temple, Jesus stops to fashion a whip. Then this gentle Lamb of God uses the weapon in hand to clear the crowd. The magnitude of authority and physical presence that he brought to the event can only be guessed at, but it might be said to be significant. All his detractors could do despite the availability of men to arrest and restrain an ordinary man, was to ask for a sign to authenticate Jesus' authority, quote, to do all this. John 2, 14 through 16. In dismissing force as a tool available to the individual by holding to rhetoric like, Jesus wouldn't do that, we forget that Jesus is, quote, the exact representation of his, God the Father's, being, as is written in the book of Hebrews 1, 3. The larger question, when, taken about, when talking about forceful, even painful, or lethal intervention to save the life of an innocent person, is, does God, Old Testament to New, allow for it? Instead, we stumble over the restrained witness of the personality of the Lamb who has come not to judge the world and her inhabitants, but to lay down his life. John 3.17 Throughout Scripture, we see God's character manifested in first one attribute and then another. In the beginning, we see his organization. He brings creation out of chaos, Genesis 1-2. through We see he is compelled to for reasons that we don't fully understand, to have fellowship with man even after he has sinned. We see his wrath and judgment when Egypt is stricken with plagues, even to the point where all of her firstborn are slain, Exodus 12, 29. 
We see something of the magnitude of his power and authority over nature when he rolls back the waters and crosses his people over on dry land. Exodus 14, 21 through 22. His character is vast and wonderful, too awesome to be manifested completely at once to simple man. And in Jesus Christ, like no other time in recorded history, we see God's character trait of compassion. It is not only exposed on the cross, it is manifested daily as Jesus proclaims through his life that no sin is too immense for God to forgive. Every interaction indulges the notion that eternal life is available to all who receive him. The point is, Jesus was atoning for the sins of mankind and giving witness of a spiritual salvation that transcends the limits of civil law and even Mosaic law. It is arguable that his message would only have been obfuscated had it also included a strong involvement in the physical civil affairs of the day. Our minds are so easily confused and clouded. To have condemned the woman caught in adultery might have mixed his message. Would we then be inclined to see adultery as an unpardonable sin? At any rate, the obligations of the law required more of a burden of proof than her accusers could offer. John 8, 3 through 11. The New Testament scriptures actually leave us with a fairly clear statement on the use of defensive force. Jesus is preparing his disciples, as he has done on other occasions, because he is getting close to the completion of his ministry. He is going to the cross. By reading Luke 22, 35-38, we note the following. Number one, Jesus is reminding the disciples that he has miraculously protected them and provided for their needs during the earlier missionary journey he sent them on. They can trust him. Number two, with his imminent crucifixion, he warns them that there are some changes they should anticipate. The world that hated him is going to hate them too. Going to the cross is not the final chapter. They need to plan on and prepare for adversity. Number three, among the provisions they need to acquire to themselves is a sword. It is not used in a military sense where everyone would be required to have one. Instead, he says, that is enough, when the disciples point out, here are two swords. Two swords among twelve men is not an aggressive call to arms. It is a defensive preparation. Now, if we can defend our own lives, and we are instructed to love our neighbors as ourselves, we can also defend our helpless neighbor's life. For an answer to quote-unquote, who is my neighbor, read the story of the Good Samaritan, Luke 10, 29-37. Those who oppose a justification for force will proceed to argue that Jesus ordered his disciples to quote-unquote, put away their swords, after Peter has impetuously sheared away the ear of a soldier or servant, John 18 verse 11. But by citing this as proof text, they pull scripture out of context. When Jesus rebuked Peter, it was because he was interfering with a foreordained plan. Jesus was going to the cross. Peter had been rebuked before for suggesting that this, the cross, shall never happen to you, Matthew 16, 22 through 23. And he had not fully grasped the lesson. This scripture, to put away the sword, in no way abandons the concept of either being allowed to defend yourself or another innocent person from unjust aggression. Recall that it was only hours before this event took place that Jesus instructed the disciples to go out and buy a sword. It is more likely that Peter simply got his messages confused. The larger argument to support the use of defensive action to protect the innocent is the silence of Scripture. The New Testament does not contradict, eradicate, or throw out the Old Testament mandate to rescue the innocent. Proverbs 24, 11-12 the child in utero is considered to be equal to the value of any born person. Exodus 21, 22 through 25. We see no retraction of the right of individuals to defend against an unjust aggressor. Exodus 22, 1. And Old Testament to New, we find that concern for the well-being of another ought to be manifest in our lives. Exodus 22, 21. Exodus 22 through 24. Um, the verses 22, 26 through 27, Leviticus 19, 33 through 34, and Luke 6, 
31. Finally, it is relevant to remember that all Scripture is, quote, God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. Those words were written at a time when the word Scripture referred to the wealth of Old Testament records accepted by the Church. The New Testament did not exist in the bound and authorized versions we have today. It cannot be reliably argued that a moral law must be specifically upheld in the New Testament in order for it to have relevance today. Revised and reprinted with permission, Life Advocate Magazine, October 1993.